Hello, a very good morning. It is Monday the 24th of October and we're here to start your week. We are indeed. Today we're talking Tories in turmoil, fish fixing and creepy crafts. First up, a day is a long time in politics and they're certainly feeling on the UK right now. At 7.15 we're going to have the latest on the race to number 10. And also coming up later on, one in 10 women will be diagnosed with endometriosis in their lives. Later on, we're going to meet the 22 year old who was forced to give up her job due to the pain related to the disease. And what it is. Exactly, like endometriosis, how it manifests itself. Some people don't know they have it. We'll be chatting all about that in just a little while. Plus, after nine, we're going to find out how the reports of, rig uh, reports of rigging have rocked the world of Irish dancing. I was talking to someone involved in this, but they're in a different, they're not, they're That's in insane. a different Irish dancing uh, organisation. Oh my God, like the scandal. It's the a scandal, that's mad. Alan, the world of Irish dancing. Don't get me started. Nothing. <laughs> He's gone. He's gone. The things oh, he knows. The things he now, knows. We have some great food, fashion, and frightful festooning that's all coming up. Yes, minestrone soup is on today's menu. On the catwalk, we've got looks for the long weekend. And then we're going to be doing our own DIY decorations for Halloween. That's coming up a little later on. But Derek, where are you this morning? Yes, uh, we're live here in Sagerton, South West County Dublin this morning. It's a very dry and settled start, a little bit of mist, low cloud out there this morning. And we do a shout to the west, northwest later on tonight. But if we swing the camera around, what a morning we have lined up for you because we're down here in Logwoods in Sagart and we're going all Halloween -y. We're getting a taste for all things festive right across the morning. And of course, we're going to be catching up with Pete the Builder. And that's all to come straight off Hell Week as well in around 8.45 this morning. Look at this for a line. Love it, love it. You're just <laughs> raving, you are. Beetlejuice was raving. I'm trying to do what Beetlejuice was doing. Great Loved stuff. It. Looking forward to that, Derek. Thank you very much. But now it's time to get the news. Let's go over to Nicole Garnon. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. Rishi Sunak looks set to become the next British Prime Minister later today without a leadership contest. Boris Johnson last night announced he was pulling out of the race, saying he'd come to the conclusion that running would not be the right thing to do. He claimed he'd gained the required support of 100 MPs, though fewer than 60 had publicly backed him. Penny Mordaunt has also declared she's running, but hasn't yet reached the required threshold. Tory MPs have until two o'clock to state who they're backing, with several Johnson supporters already switching to Sunak. The crisis over the lack of state accommodation for people arriving from Ukraine will be discussed by the three government party leaders later today. It follows concerns over the weekend about a lack of suitable places for people to go. The three government party leaders and a number of senior ministers meet later today to try to tackle the lack of accommodation for Ukrainian nationals and others arriving here seeking refuge. Speaking at the weekend, Taoiseach Micheál Martin said, Ireland has been very fast at responding to a wartime situation. He said the government will continue to try to build additional capacity and to speed things up. In the week to last Thursday, almost 1,400 people arrived here from Ukraine. The same week it was announced the City West Transit hub had reached capacity and the government said that no more state accommodation existed to house new arrivals. I, I think it's scandalous that anybody would be faced with sleeping on the street. So that's Ukrainian refugees, that's Syrian refugees, that's Irish homeless people. Nobody should be sleeping on the streets and we have the resources to ensure that they don't have to. I mean, the, the most immediate resolution that's needed is the, the state needs to get access to more hotel rooms. As winter moves in and the attacks on Ukraine go on, people are set to keep leaving the country in large numbers. The Taoiseach says the lack of accommodation is not just an Irish phenomenon, but is being seen Europe-wide. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. Ahead of that leaders' meeting this evening, one government minister told Virgin Media News that the situation at the weekend was not acceptable and that government is working hard to find a solution. I would say this as well, that from the government down, the Irish people have done a huge amount to look after Ukrainians, to integrate them uh, and to give them a chance uh, until uh, this war ends. So we are doing our absolute utmost to get appropriate accommodation for everybody, as is our legal duty. That is really, really difficult. And it's difficult for every member state of the European Union. Um, but we are doing our absolute best. And I'm very sorry uh, that some people have not got that accommodation over the last number of days. But we're working really, really hard to rectify that. 
38 people lost their lives in workplace accidents last year. It's a 30% reduction on 2020 and the lowest number since the Health and Safety Authority was founded. However, there were more than 8,000 non-fatal incidents at work, an increase of 8% on the figure for the previous year. University Hospital Limerick is asking the public to consider all alternatives before going to its emergency department, warning that people who don't require urgent care can expect long delays. In a statement last night, the hospital said it's seeing large volumes of patients attending. Those who are seriously ill or injured or worried that their life is in danger are still being advised to attend. At least two people have died in Mexico after a Category 3 hurricane made landfall yesterday. Rosalind touched down near Santa Cruz with wind speeds of over 200 kilometres an hour, according to the National Hurricane Centre. Trees were blown down, streets flooded and more than 150,000 homes were left without power. It's now been downgraded to a tropical storm, with authorities warning that mudslides and further flooding are still possible. The Trump Organization is set to go on trial in New York today for alleged tax crimes. The former president's longtime chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, is expected to be the star witness. He's previously pleaded guilty to 15 counts connected to the alleged tax fraud scheme within the organization. He was promised a sentence of five months instead of 15 years if he agreed to cooperate and testify. A major fire has broken out on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Local residents and firefighters have been battling to get the blaze under control. The fire is near the Katanga site, used by climbers at about 4,000 metres. The cause of the fire is not yet known. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Jeffrey. And a very good morning to you at home. If you're indeed streaming online on the player, we're coming to you live here from Logwoods and Sagart in South West Dublin this morning. I've got all my friends here behind me because we're going all halloween -y this Monday morning. Of course, we're going to be catching up with Pete the Builder. Uh, that's all to come straight off Halloween in around 8.45 this morning. So let's take an opening look at weather. Slipping past 7 o'clock here this morning and it is a dry and settled start here. It's actually, you'll be glad to hear. Now, we are seeing a couple of hit and miss showers through parts of the southwest into Clare, South Galway, and in fact, Granard into Edwardstown in County Longford, not escaping any so rain gear at the ready there <laughs> in those uh, light to moderate west southwesterly winds. Now, right across today, in fact, a pretty decent day in store. We're going to see that mixture of sunshine and scattered showers. Again, a little bit uh, wet through parts of the west and into northern areas, but elsewhere, a pretty decent day in store. Top values in around 11 to 15, even 16 degrees, so still holding relatively mild for this time of year. Finally then tonight, once again, we're looking at western shares elsewhere. It will dry out. So once again, a pretty settled start as we edge away into your Tuesday morning. That's all to come uh, with values there. Sorry, <laughs> I got confused in and around at 7 to 11 degrees. So that's your weather for now. Come back to us live here in Sagard at 7.35. Come on, guys. <laughs> For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Coming up next, as Boris Johnson dramatically drops out of the race for Prime Minister, who is going to be number 10? We're going to discuss that after the next, after the break. You're very welcome back. Now, Boris has backed out, leaving Rishi Sunak, the favourite to replace Liz Truss as UK Prime Minister. Here with more on the race to number 10 in the UK is Jack Horgan-Jones, political reporter with the Irish Times, along with media consultant Enda Brady, who is, of course, based uh, in the UK. It's lovely to have you both with us this morning. Enda, if we can start with you, last night, you know, all the notifications started coming in. Boris is out because he'd been so good to fly all the way home from his three-month holiday um, in the Caribbean um, because he wanted to go back into number 10. What's the story? Why did he back out? He needed 100 votes in order to be uh, to be included in the race today. Did he have them? So he claimed he had the 100 mid-afternoon yesterday. And as with everything with Boris Johnson, I'm putting the word claimed in capital letters with uh, quotation marks around the edge there. I'm not sure he did have the numbers. It became quickly apparent to him that even if he did get to 100, even if he did win and beat Sunak and Penny Mordaunt, he wouldn't have the kind of enough competent people to form a cabinet, to take all the paid ministerial roles. 
And he hinted at that in his statement where he said that to be able to govern, you need a united party. He's a very divisive figure, even more so now. And it wasn't a good look, you know, flying back from the Caribbean, third foreign holiday since July. And he'd actually gone on holidays while Parliament was sitting. So it's not a good look. The country needs someone serious and Rishi Sunak appears to be that man. Uh, it was an incredible statement to say that he was well-placed to deliver a Conservative victory in 2024, considering where they are at the minute. He's got his 102 nominations, but came to the conclusion now was not the right thing to do. I mean, fair play to him, isn't it? I mean, that's the front page of The Guardian as well. Not the right time. Yeah, but, you know, make no mistake, he hasn't gone away. He will happily just sit it out now on the back benches. He's, he's this kind of huge presence in the Conservative Party. The membership, the core membership in places like where I live here in Oxfordshire, you know, they've previously adored him. But I think a lot of people now realise that Britain and certainly the Conservative Party needs to move to a post-Johnson era. Sunak is a very serious character, a very different man. He understands money. And that's what's needed. I mean, you can see him there. He's 42. He's been an MP for Richmond up in North Yorkshire for seven years now. He's a multimillionaire. His wife is from a family of billionaires. He certainly understands money. And I think he needs to get in and very, very quickly sort out the UK's finances because Liz Truss has left the house burning, really. Yeah, well, he understands people... money because he has a lot of that's it. That's what I'm saying. He's always had it, which, you know, when you're talking about a country who is at the highest inflation they've had in so many years and people are running to food banks, 18 million people uh, using food banks, more than that now, families I think it is. If we're talking about Penny Mordaunt and Rishi Sunak, who uh, are the two, it appears to be, um, the, the two that have officially declared, uh, do you think it is going to be a coronation for Sunak today, Enda? Yeah, I, I think, where are we now, what, 20 past seven in the morning? I think by two o'clock you will see Sunak named as the only... Um, Penny Mordaunt hasn't got the numbers. The threshold was 100. There are 357 Conservative MPs. I mean, Penny Mordaunt is a very competent government minister. She's got huge ambitions. You know, she registered a website there, PM for PM, a long time ago. So that will tell you where her, her belief in herself lies. Um, but she's not going to be Prime Minister this time. It'll be Rishi Sunak. It'll be a coronation. And Britain now will have its, what, third prime minister in seven weeks. I mean, it's it's bizarre what has been happening here. And at some point, the general public will want to say in this, will want an election. Yes. But what support will he get, Enda? Because as we're talking about this, he's going to have to make difficult decisions. He's going to have to come in and do something to the tax system. But realistically, he has got, between him and his wife, the money that they have, I mean, they're nearly billionaires to be trying to declare different things on people who are going through a cost of living crisis. Also, his wife was uh, in trouble for uh, dodging tax as well. That was reputed as well at one yeah. stage too. So, you know, in terms of support, will he get much support? Like, what does, what's the, the public feeling out there for him? Well, I, I think if I was Rishi Sunak, I'd be looking at the positives straight off. <sighs> Liz Truss will go down in history as the worst prime minister ever. And having followed on from Boris Johnson, that is quite some to make. So it's a pretty low bar. The public have zero expectation now at this stage. So what they want is someone competent, intelligent and serious and someone who will come in and put in a day's work. And he has said that in his statement. He will work day in and day out. Uh, and that's a swipe at Boris Johnson. I mean, if you go back to COVID, Johnson missed the first five COBRA meetings when the virus emerged. He simply didn't turn up. So Sunak is making it clear that he will work hard. He is a grafter. I've spent time around him. He's an impressive guy. He looks the part. He sounds the part. But the problem he has is these different factions. There are five different factions inside the Conservative Party, all fighting. They don't know what they are anymore. And the UK public really is a breaking point. Like you were saying, Marin, about, you know, Food banks, there are 2,200 food banks across the United Kingdom. Inflation is running at 10.1%. I mean, it's a complete mess. And Sunak has to come in now, shore the UK finances up, and hit the ground running really, really quickly. Yeah, it's uh, very much a case there of the have and had. Now, the southern part of the, of the UK, it seems to be quite well. And then the northern part, there's really places that have very little going on. If we can just bring you in here, uh, Jack, because...
obviously, like, we're all looking at this as though it's EastEnders, but mm. it does have very serious implications. We know that Rishi Sunak works very well with Pascal Donoghue, mm. our Minister for Finance. They seem to be good buddies. They like sci-fi. They chat about all that sort of stuff. <laughs> they're but both nerds, you can they're say. Both kinda, <laughs> they're both kind of nerdy. Um, but our Foreign Affairs Minister, Simon Coveney, he has expressed frustration at the instability in Westminster, saying mm. that it's hampering efforts to build a good, strong relationship with the UK. Mm. And of course, we've got issues going on with Northern Ireland. There's nothing like we need to get an assembly going on in Stormont. So from an Irish point of view, who's the best person to be in number 10? Oh, they're ready for Rishi to use okay. his own campaign slogan. I think that they would have picked him before when Johnson went. They would have Even though he's very much him. a right-wing libertarian. But he's, he's, someone, he's someone with whom they can do business. He's someone, he, he's, he's what they call in inverted commas, a normal politician. You know, he's someone who's seen as pragmatic, and that's a word that gets thrown back at you a lot when you talk to people in Dublin, when you talk to figures in government. You know, he's a, he's a pragmatic guy. He understands the cut and thrust of politics, but also the serious business, the serious managerial business of being a, a political leader. And that's what people uh, in Dublin feel has been missing from London for a political generation or more. Um, now, is he going to be the kind of transcendent political leader who can pull together all the various bucking factions of the Conservative Party? that Enda has outlined and solve the enormous open wound that is post-Brexit uh, UK, UK politics? I think perhaps not, but certainly he would be seen from Dublin and also importantly from other European capitals as a step in the right direction, or at least not a sprint in the wrong direction like Liz Truss was. It's been awfully entertaining though, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've been glued to it all weekend. Much, much, much better than East Enders. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. like it is, it's going to have disastrous consequences. Yeah. You know, and we don't know really the fallback from this. Once you get past the disaster, once you get past the what? impact on real people, like, like it is, it is incredible. Mess. It is incredible because look, we, we all grew up in an age where the UK was, and its, and its politics was kind of fairly staid and predictable most yeah. of the time. And it had a kind of political managerial class, you know? And what has happened since the UK, or since the Brexit vote in 2016, has been, you know, effectively torching that mainstream uh, politics. You know, Brexit is the kind of hinge point in recent political history and trying to grapple with what it means and how to implement it has fundamentally changed and realigned and reshaped British politics. And it's been incredible to watch. And in many ways, the last 44 days, 45 days of Liz Truss, um, of her premiership was kind of the logical outworkings of Brexit. You know, you try and take uh, you try and take all the regulations and make a bonfire. You try and cut taxes and slash them and, and make this kind of bold intervention yeah. in politics as it should be done. And what happens is the markets gobble you up. You yeah. know, your own party gobbles you up. The opposition gobble you up. There's, there's a contact with reality there, which is one of the phrases that I saw over the weekend in the FT. You know, this, this um, project, mm. once it, it didn't survive its first contact with reality. And so now I think that that British politics, and you see this through uh, the ascent, I suppose, of Rishi Sunak, is probably going to swing back to the mainstream. But, I mean, how effective will that be? You made the point, Marianne, as well, this guy is an remarkably wealthy guy, you know. They always are, they though. Al they always the Conservatives are. are always bar And he's Thatcher. effectively going to have level. to do austerity, you know, because partially because yeah. of the, <clears throat> the, the, the kind of overriding trends in the UK economy and partially because of the fallout from the fiscal event that was the mini-budget. Yeah. They're going to have to cut. They're going to have to cut quite seriously in the optics of a very wealthy man, mm. Conservative government, Talking you know, about Sec second uh, um, PM now to go in without a general election. You know, there's a democratic deficit there mm. and it's yawning and he's going to be have to do very unpopular um, policies. So the view from Dublin, to bring it full circle, is that they welcome his appointment, but like, do they think it solves anything fundamentally? Not, ne no. not necessarily. And do they think it solves very pressing issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol? You know, the likelihood of another storm and election before Christmas? Again, none of these things are solved. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt necessarily, but it doesn't mm. draw a line under them, absolutely not. Yeah. Well, one thing we've learned from this morning is that Jack Horgan Jones reads the FT. He's pure fancy, everybody, <laughs> to let you know. Um, from the political reporter with the Irish Times, you're not going anywhere, Jack. You're going to stay with us for a little while. And Enda Brady, um, you know, I think you're... Look at the smile on his face. He's been enjoying it as well, even though he's in the middle of it uh, with everything that's going on. It's been a pleasure chatting to you this morning. We'll talk to you again soon, Enda. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Alan. Drama oh, in the, the UK. Drama. We're going to calm it down a bit now, are we? Yeah. Now, did you know that switching to supermarket-owned brands could save you more than a thousand euro every year? We're going to be discussing this plus the rest of today's top stories after the break.
It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. It's headline, Sunak poised to become UK leader as Johnson pulls out. Rishi Sunak is poised to become the British Prime Minister later today following Boris Johnson's sensational exit from the Conservative Party leadership race, race last night. The Examiner leads with damning report on process of planning decisions. Board Planala has re received evidence of a romantic relationship in the organisations that could have had impact on board decisions and procedures, according to an internal report. Things that are coming out about that. Anyway, the mirror goes with man stabbed to death in Booze Row. A man was stabbed in a drunken row before he died in hospital over the weekend. The Star's front page with Burns' bodyguard, the family of slain Kinahan mobster David Burns, spent thousands on facial reconstruction so that he could have an open casket at his wake, it has emerged. The Sun leads with Wine Bottler, three hero guardy who disarmed gangster Derek Bottler Devoy whilst he was on a gun rampage and also holding a live grenade at the time, could be prosecuted for their roles during his arrest. Plan to hand over empty, empty houses to Ukrainian refugees. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The government is working on a new scheme to encourage people to hand over empty homes to house Ukrainian refugees in return for financial payment. Refugee plan in disarray is the top story on the Daily Mail today. And finally, the Herald headline reads, We were told we could be housed. Ukrainian refugees who spent the weekend sleeping in Dublin Airport have said they would have not travelled here if they'd had known there was no accommodation for them. Jack Horgan Jones from uh, the Irish Times has stayed with us uh, for our top stories. Jack, thank you so much uh, for this. Of course, the Ukrainian refugees in the situation is the top story mm. because, as we heard there, the Ukrainian re refugees who were left sleeping in Dublin Airport said we wouldn't, we would, we would have tried to go to a different country if we'd known we had no place to go. Mm. And that's what um, the Ukrainian ambassador has said. Could you please just tell people there's no place to put them and they might try to travel to a different country? Yeah, and I suspect that message will be going out through all those kind of informal networks that, that often bind migrants together because one thing is quite clear, and you see it across the front pages this morning, uh, Ireland now has a real problem in providing shelter, mm. accommodation and food to people who are fleeing uh, the conflict and coming here. And you see that uh, in Dublin Airport over the weekend. It was clear this was going to happen last week. It happened already uh, earlier on this summer where the, the state's yeah. immigration system basically toppled over and it happened again with 40 people uh, either uh, on the floor of the airport or with, or with nowhere to go. And it's going to, I think, potentially get worse before it gets better because the um, the scale of the thing is such that uh, there's, I think, 25% of all hotel rooms in Ireland are now yeah, occupied 25%. by the effort. Yeah, And on top of that, you have a, a major increase in the number of people seeking international protection here. So the, there's, mm. there's two distinct, there's a yeah. distinction mm. that's yeah. made here it's between not just benefit, beneficiaries of yeah. temporary protection, which is people fleeing the situation in Ukraine, and international protection uh, applicants who are effectively those who, who end up in, in direct provision. Um, and there's been a huge increase in, obviously, you know, the number of Ukrainians was something that we didn't deal with last year, but the the number of people coming here seeking international protection has also doubled. So there's enormous pressure and um, the, 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 the absence, I suppose, of medium term solutions to this problem is something which is yeah. now catching up on I us. I mean, when you, when you look at it, and Simon Coveney said yesterday, mm. it's the size of Waterford, the population of Waterford mm. City mm. have come in here and we've housed them. And obviously, like, there are problems here, but I mean, how have we done towards other European uh, nations mm. regarding housing the refugees at the moment? I think I think that Ireland has been above average. It's been a little while since I looked at the, at the figures precisely, but certainly the last time I looked, you know, we are better than average per head of population. Mm. I mean, but the, the one thing is that we, have, we, haven't, we haven't really housed these people. We've certainly accommodated them. Yeah. We've provided for them. Right. We've provided... But has any country housed them properly? But no. what, what, what we haven't done is, as I say, and I hate to return to this, but when you talk to people working on the front line, when you, when you listen to people um, like Lee Dwyer, from the Irish Red Cross who was out on the radio yesterday yeah. talking about how we haven't done this kind of medium term planning and he's pointing the finger at, not at the Department of Integration or the Department of Children which is responsible for taking these people in when they arrive into Dublin Airport or Ross Airport but at the Department of Housing which has always been responsible for developing that medium term option but when you look at the, the, the split of the numbers I mean there's there's I, I think there's more than 30,000 in hotels mm. there's a few odd thousand in pledged accommodation there's a few more thousand in emergency accommodation but there's nobody 
in what could be described as housing. You know, these, well, we these don't people have are, it, so we're accommodating. Exactly, them. and that's the problem. You know, we're running into these other pre-existing crises, housing and homelessness ones, which are uh, being accentuated to a degree by this, and people are now being exposed to that. You know, yeah. so the, it, it's another part of this kind of rolling series of crises that we face going into and the winter. And I'm not trying to clap us on the back, but in looking mm. at, at other European countries mm -hmm. who are trying to accommodate refugees, there is a situation that, that there are 10 cities happening mm. now, and it's not a good thing. We need to sort something out, but we've got people who are in direct provision, who have been provided, who are like, they are asylum, they have been successful mm -hmm. in, in, in their application to stay in yes. Ireland. They could be asked to start paying yes. yeah. uh, for what's happening mm. in direct provision, which mm. is... Like, it doesn't seem like the accommodations were... Yeah, and I, I, I believe they also have some money already deducted from their social they welfare. They do. Um, so, look, this is, this is part of a kind of, I think, a hardening of the stance where the state is trying to project subtly, perhaps not very loudly, but, you know, that it, if you come here, it may not be quite as easy. So you, you have things like... Do you think this will pay. discourage people you, you from think, coming yeah. here? Is that the I think, idea I think that's, as well? that, that's the subtext. Yeah, I think so. So another example beyond people in direct vision is people, the, the, the Ukrainian, the BOTP, uh, the temporary protection uh, applicants, they may be asked to make a contribution from their social welfare payment to yeah. the meals that they receive in hotels. Now, that's not a financial measure because the issue here is not the bill that the state is left with. That, that that is, that is more than, than taken care of, you know, I mean, mm. that's not the pressure that the government is facing, the pressure is, is capacity. So I think that things like that, some of the reforms that we saw to visa-free travel, all these kind of slight hardening of the stance in the migration and immigration space is trying to send that yeah. signal across. So you do think from today people will be told, look at try and look somewhere else, There's don't no come to Ireland, there's no space. You I think that that's w what's implicit and, and yeah. what they'll be told on arrival here uh, is that, you know, they, they, they can't be accommodated and you will see more and more people, I think, unfortunately, on the streets. And you talk to people on the front line, you talk to the politicians yeah. involved and they yeah. say that is the reality. And there are so far in Ireland, 70 people who are homeless have died yes. this year in Ireland yeah. and that's something like, can't forget that and there's over 10,000 people homeless in this country, 0896 mm. 111111. Uh, we're going to move on very quickly to, this is hardly surprising, I mean, I think at this stage, everyone who switched has tried to switch but yes. it's like a new thing from Aldi switch yeah. to, to non-brands and yeah. you could save yourself how much? So 100 well, euro yeah. a month or 12, euro a month. 1200 euro a year off the grocery shopping from changing uh, from your well-known brands to the to the supermarket equivalent and yeah. I think the thing is as Maureen said what if you've done that already? Yeah but people have like, done that and they still are, yeah. are scraping by. Yeah exactly yeah but I mean I, like look I mean it's 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 low-hanging fruit to an extent it and, is and yeah given the fact that you know inflation is where it is grocery price inflation and that that basket of shopping goods is getting more expensive people are going to be looking for all those little marginal gains around the edges um, my favorite thing to do is, is to kind of uh, I, I like to find the cheekiest kind of ripoff of uh, of a big name oh, yeah. brand that you see my favorite is wheat bisques <laughs> wheat bisques <laughs> wheat bisques in Aldi yeah but it's saying I that do I enjoy going around and going how close can they <laughs> get to the they name get before it's copyrighted <laughs> Without <laughs> being, you're going to get sued. Yeah, exactly. but they're because we all know pretty close to weed. We all know about a special chocolate bunny. Yeah, that there has been and a, and a cake caterpillar. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. there has been uh, issues yes, with yes, as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that there have been But done. they are saying a staggering you, your average shop could rise by 662 euro this year. And that's yeah. on top of everything else. Everything's you know, expensive. On top of everything yeah. else. Have you switched already, I'm sure? Or that is, is there no. something, you know the way sometimes kids are really at attached to the brands that they mm. love and they like the pictures or whatever? Oh, wait, nine, six, triple Our children, one, you just sort of say, we, we're not getting that this week, we're getting something else. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> Good luck. Does that work? Yeah. Um, Does that work? I was, I was attached to expensive wine once, but... <laughs> 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 oh, yes, we remember those okay. days. Uh, now Mashed we... potato and a money. Yes. Oh, this Explain. Is what's happening? So this is uh, effective, very high profile interventions by climate activists. And we saw this last week, unfortunately for the activists concerned on the same day, I think that Liz Truss resigned. Oh, they dear. did, um, they, they threw something at the, uh, at the uh, Sunflowers. Van Gogh, sunflowers. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember what it was now off the top of my head, but some sort of food stuff. They beans. Beans, that was it, it was beans. beans, yeah, yeah. So they, this is the latest attempt to, I suppose, in a very visible way, and that's the idea to, to try and draw attention to the fact that, you know, um, the climate uh, crisis is getting all altogether worse. It's very watery mash. Sorry, it? our producer is gone. That's uh, our that's loud producer is gone. That's terrible mash. Terrible Who would eat that? Terrible mash. You would be. That looks that. like fake. That's own brand. That's brand like terrible for eating, but <laughs> excellent at achieving, excellent for achieving for coverage <laughs> across a, a, a priceless ma masterpiece. Yeah, so but I suppose it's, it's strong attention to, 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 well, to it's the sure fact is. that you know, it's a more serious. Yeah, issue, yeah. yeah, a much more serious issue, and I think uh, points to a, a growing kind of you know uh, militarism within the, the the activist community. I mean, remember a couple of years ago we had. 
had the um, the Extinction Rebellion yeah. protests in Dublin, which is something that we've never seen before. And I think that perhaps we should get more used to this because people are becoming more and more radicalised, well, and often with good reason. You and know? nothing's happened. Like you just wipe that off. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with the like the yes. Monet is fine. Don't worry about it, lads. But if the planet is gone in a hundred years, the Monet is gone as well. Do you exactly. Know what I mean? And I suppose that's the you idea were, gets us talking some, about it. So know? it was Mash on a Monet. Radishes yeah. at a Rembrandt. Yeah. Mushrooms Car Carver, at Carvery at a Caravaggio. A whole oh, Carvery at a Caravaggio. Yeah. On a Sunday. Yeah. On a Sunday. <laughs> we'll do mushrooms at a Michelangelo. Do you know, we we'll just go. keep the alliterative thing more? going. Yeah. Them coming in. We know it's serious. 0896 oh, yeah, Jack Horgan Jones, you've put in a great shift with us this morning. Thanks, Thank folks. you so much. Plenty to do today. At two o'clock is when we're expecting to find out yes. who um, PM. our P, the PM of Across the Water is going to yes. be. It'll be Rishi. Rishi. It'll, It'll be Rishi. Yeah. Okay, he's already said it. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon, Jack. Uh, now, Rory McIlroy is on top of the world while Ronaldo's future is unclear. We've got the biggest sports stories coming up after the break. What a weekend for Irish sport. Of course, fans are celebrating after boxing and golfing wins all weekend. Yeah, the golf, it's ours. Team sport, it's definitely ours. It's Gavin Cooney from it. the42.ie and former Dublin footballer. Paddy Andrews, have more on that. Joking. I'm just saying, Paddy's like, say something, say something to me, say something to me. Um, let's talk, first of all, Gavin, about the fantastic showing mm. at the Euros for Irish boxing. Ten, uh, ten women team, seven medals. Ireland topped the medal table for the first time in Irish amateur boxing history. It's extraordinary. Um, obviously, you know, Katie Taylor led to Kelly Harrington, so they've always been the two superstars, but the depth of talent is, is outrageous. Oh. It, it's, it's insane when you talk about that top of the medal table. Like 30 countries take, took part, nine went home empty handed, nine with just a solitary bronze. Mm. So for Ireland to top with three golds, two silver, and two bronze, like, you know, for women's boxing, you know, and we you talked about Kelly and Katie leading the mm. charge, but the, the the row in behind this is phenomenal. Yeah, no, it's it's outstanding, and it is a testament to their coach as well, Zor Anti. I mean, he's one of the most oh. successful coaches in Irish history, and he won coach coach of the tournament. You know, he was uh, he was almost weighed down by medals and trophies as he was leaving. It's it is just phenomenal to see what's happening. Kelly was bawling her eyes out as always. I mean, <laughs> the heart on the sleeve thing, you can't help but adore adore them all. They mm. were amazing. Like, I think we've got uh, Amy Broadhurst and her son, Zach, they're on the front of, I think it's the, is it the Indo the today? And yeah. Kelly and her dog, Gus, when she got home, like gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous pictures. But something that has emerged that has been a story in the background for quite a few years that's never come to the fore because mm. no one ever really wanted to talk about it. And that's Previously, when Kelly when Kelly was coming up around the time of Katie, yeah. she has criticised in her autobiography all of the emphasis that was put on Katie to the detriment of other women because you know the coach was Pete Taylor, Katie's dad, and he was focused on Katie and, mm. and kind of and now we can see like we can see what can happen when yeah. the love is spread, Gavin. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. But the love can, in this context of the Olympics, the love can only be spread so far because it's going to be super mm. competitive because, like, so Amy Broadhurst and Kelly win gold medals at the weekend, but only one of them will go to the Olympics because there's only one spot in the lightweight division. So they'll have to basically um, box off mm. in Ireland for the right to go to the, uh, to go to the Olympic Games. So that shows how, I mean, it hasn't, the sport hasn't been helped by the fact that it's been, there's been just such a kind of a narrow opportunity to be exposed at the Olympic Games and at the oh. top level. I mean, it's amazing Huge for such a small country punching well above its weight as well. And I suppose we'll claim Rory McIlroy as well. That was a Come good on. pun. That was a good pun. That uh, was a good pun, wasn't it? Did you know you did a pun? Yeah, of course I did, yeah. Um, <laughs> punching, punching. Uh, Rory McIlroy, back number one in the world. Yeah, and look, I think over the last probably six months, he has been the outstanding player. And yesterday, is, it was his opening tournament of the year. It's a new season in the PGA Tour, but he's just carried on where he left off with the FedEx Cup last year. So... He's been, off the course, he's been outstanding. Yeah. We spoke about this before in terms of his stance. He's nearly the poster boy for, for the good of golf, if, if for, for want of a better word. But the thing with Rory, it's six months until the next major. Mm. And by the time the Masters rolls around, it'll be nine years since he won his last major. And without a doubt, as brilliant as his success has been over the last six months, and to get back to the top of the world rankings, Rory McIlroy wants to win major championships. Yeah. So he's been, traditionally, he's been quite a streaky player when he, he gets hot for probably a month or two and wins two or three tournaments. You just hope he can carry this on into Augusta next April. And without a doubt, for 2023, he's been the standout player for the last six months. 
can he keep it going Cause it, and, it, and rack up a couple of more majors? It was always that way with the Irish rugby team, you know, fantastic. And then it's two years out from a World yeah, Cup yeah, and then yeah, we're yeah. on a downward trajectory. Hey, we're looking good at the minute. We are, we are, we are, we are. We are. We are. The CJ Cup Leinster slash Irish team are doing but, fantastic. But what, but what he's done off the course has been outstanding and he's just carried... You feel like it's nearly... It's helped his game, in a he's way. Play, yeah, he's playing like it's a joy to watch. Yeah, yeah. He, he's so confident in himself. He understands the responsibility he has. And, and if anything, that added pressure has nearly focused him even more. And like I say, over the last six months, he's been outstanding. 33? Yeah. It, it just, listen, it's brilliant to see this, but he's won these tr trophies before. As you just said, though, Paddy, it's going to come down to the Masters. Yeah. He, he wants to win Augusta. He wants to kind of, like, if he sees himself at that very top level, and rightfully so. Mm. so and he is, and he is. But with the level of Masters that he has, you know, he's not or, or of majors. He yeah. probably isn't. Um, quickly, I, I just wanted to touch on the football as well. Mm. And because, Paddy, I know you were over at, like, the big talking <laughs> point, of course, Arsenal drop points at the weekend and City look like they're back. But the big talking point for me, I saw Keane and Neville go at it on Sky Sports yeah. this weekend about Ronaldo. And you were there. I, I don't understand how Keane can stick up. Keane can stick up for Ronaldo, not wanted to come on as a, off the bench. And you were there for that game against Spurs, where he yeah. walked down the tunnel. Tommy, we, we've played elite sport, and we've been in dressing rooms. It is indefensible. Like at the time, I was actually at the game in Old Trafford last week, and hoping to see Ronaldo for, for a yeah, last time. Like everybody, yeah. And the whole stadium could see him walking down the tunnel. It is indefensible to, to refuse to the coach and to your teammates to come on. And the incredible thing from the weekend, aside from what happened on the pitch, Rio Ferdinand, Roy Keane defending him. Yeah. And you're thinking, Roy Keane, hold on a second. If, uh, yeah. If that was anyone else, imagine Paul Pogba did that. Oh, what Roy Keane would be saying. Time. And we were chatting off air. It feels like Roy Keane is nearly talking about himself there mm. <laughs> and how he finished at Man United and he felt he was kind of pushed out the door. So I think there was a lack of credibility because if you played sport, even at any level, you cannot do what Ronaldo's doing. Yeah, I just think if you're a pundit and you can't tell it straight and actually you're sticking up for your pals... But it was so obvious as well. It says an the, awful lot. Is thing. he gone, um, Gavin? Oh, he'd have to go, yeah. yeah. He's, he's, you know, he's not on the team and he's clearly been frozen out now. And how beautiful politi political gameplay by Eric Ten Hag. I, I loved what Paul McGrath said. The most terrifying point in a career of professional football is the moment you're confronted with your own athletic mortality. You see the finishing line <laughs> of all that you've not known easy. and you can it's see not it's easy. not working from... Listen, <laughs> yeah. You uh, both just looked at each other there. It's not. It is. Gavin Cooney uh, from the 42.e, Paddy Andrews, Dublin footballer. You know, he's still life after football there as well. There is, there is. And on uh, the podcast, when I was watching you when the dog came on last week, it was gorgeous. <laughs> Thanks Come, so much. We're going to hear from a young woman living with endometriosis. Plus, we'll have the latest on the Irish dancing fish fixing scandal. Stay with us. We'll talk to you very shortly. Good morning, you're very welcome back to Monday's Ireland AM. You are indeed. Coming up, we're going to be meeting the 22-year-old whose organs had started to fuse together when she was finally diagnosed with endometriosis after a decade of debilitating pain. Wow. The jig's up. Later, we're going to hear how the Irish dancing community has been left reeling by the fesh fixing scandal. First, we get into the spirit of the spooky season with some DIY Halloween oh, decor. You... I was carving pumpkins all day yesterday. Now, over to Alan oh, in the Irish. kitchen. Unfair advantage, Tommy. Unfair advantage. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> now, Jack O'Keefe has something bubbling away in his cauldron this morning. What have you got? <laughs> oh, that was bad. I know. <laughs> I have a lovely autumnal minestrone. Nice little twist in an Italian classic. Minestrone? You say minestrone? Minestrone, yeah. Not minestrone. I don't know. Look, I'm from Cork. Like, you can't be judging me, you know? <laughs> Leave me alone. Come here, you have to show us your carrot. Look at this. Look at his carrot. He grew uh, this himself. It's, <laughs> it's, it's alive! Look at it. It's very stubby, isn't it? Yeah. It's, like, nah, it's, look, it's, it's very big. It's a good grower, in fairness to I'm it. I'm like. telling you, it's a good grower. <laughs> now, you're going to cut that up, put it in, or we'll I'm just admire peel it all it and morning. Chop it up. All right. Yeah. Look at it there. Oh. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I'd look, yeah. Will you send us some pictures if you have some wonky veg? Like, uh, show yeah. us again. Look at that. 
what we it's I don't know what it looks like. I don't know either. But like if you've any looks wonky tasty. veg at home, send us a dip in the picture, we'd love to see it. Uh, Derek, what are you up to this morning? Oh, I'll tell you, we're having a very spooky morning here in Logwoods this morning. A dry and settled start, some spooky showers on the way later on today. And of course, we're going to be catching up with Peter Finn, a.k.a. Pete the Builder. Oh, oh my goodness, don't do that to me, Pete. It's not good for my heart. That's all to come in the next wee while. Ooh. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline, Sunak poised to become UK leader as Johnson pulls out. Rishi Sunak is poised to become the British Prime Minister later today following Boris Johnson's sensational exit from the Conservative Party leadership race last night. The Examiner leads with damning report on process of planning decisions. On board, Planola has received evidence of a romantic relationship in the organisation that could have impacted on board decisions and procedures. That's according to an internal report. The Mirror's front page, a man stabbed to death in Booze Row. A man was stabbed in a drunken row before he died in hospital over the weekend. The Star's front page, Burns Bodyguard, the family of slain Kinnahan mobster David Burns spent thousands on facial reconstruction so that he could have an open casket at his wake. It has emerged. The Sun leads with Wine Bottler, three hero Gardaí who disarmed gangster Derek Bottler Devoy whilst he was on a gun rampage holding a submachine gun shooting it off in the middle of the day and also had a grenade. They could be prosecuted for their roles in his arrest. Plan to hand over empty houses to uh, house Ukrainian refugees. This is front page of the Irish Independent. The government is working on a new scheme to encourage people to hand over empty homes to house Ukrainian refugees in return for financial payment. Refugee plan in disarray is the top story on the Daily Mail. And finally, the Herald's headline reads, We were told we would be housed. Ukrainian refugees who spent the weekend sleeping in Dublin airport have said they would not have travelled here if they had known there was no accommodation for them. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, really is. And earlier on, we were also talking about you could save up to nearly 2,000 a year on your shopping if you change to own brands. And we were also saying a lot of people are already doing that mm. and have already changed to supermarket brands. And uh, a trick, uh, no one knows the brand. I stopped buying branded foods but kept the old boxes because we were saying it earlier on, the children might want a certain one. Mm -hmm. And it worked. I now put all the cereals and other things into clear containers so nobody sees a box. And nobody knows what the brand is. We do that with the clear containers as well. So yeah, they great. don't really know. Nah, no you just clue. tell the kids, these are your favourites. That's because Lucy likes it like that, though, isn't it? She likes well, it yeah, Aesthetically, think, it's more well, it pleasing. It kind of keeps them fresher as well, I think. Oh, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and would your, would your kids, would Emma like like a certain brand? Nah, no, she's not into that. Really, it's like it's trying to get them to eat at full size. Oh, right, Never mind yeah. what brand they gotcha. want. Gotcha. Well, so as I was um, saying earlier on, but then children probably would have a favourite. But like, if you can't afford it, just say to the child, well, we oh, listen, they we do, were, they you were having a different they get one this stuck week. stuck in their ways. Honestly, yeah. kids are a disaster like that. Susan says, <laughs> I buy shop brand for a lot of things like cereal, milk, biscuits, yogurts, but when it comes to tea bags, you won't get me to part from my oh, beloved Barry's. Barry's. Susan. Yeah. Like, I, would, I, gotcha. I wonder though, is there a difference like in, in ingredients between home brand and actual, say, wheat bisques and Weetabix? You know, like nutritionally wise, Probably do they put not. cheaper like ingredients oh, right. into it? Yeah. So are, it's actually, like, I know you're saving money, but actually, is it as healthy? There are some places we'll say that make potatoes or crisps, crisps, yeah. crisps, and they make, you know, fancy crisps, and then they make the fancy crisps for German supermarkets as well. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Just different bags. Because uh, I know certain supermarkets will have their own brands, but it's exactly the same as what the the real thing is the as well. Thing. Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. I think it, it's just for producers if if they're selling below market price. Obviously, we need to make sure everyone gets Just a quickly text as well. We were talking about the sport as well and we were discussing Paddy Andrews it was here. He was at the Man United versus Tottenham match and they were all delighted, excited to see Ronaldo, probably the greatest player of all time, come off the bench. But he refused, told the coach, I'm not coming on and stormed down the tunnel. And uh, we were just saying, I totally agree that Ronaldo was wrong to walk down the tunnel recently, but I think we all need to remember that he's probably going through a particularly tough time at the minute. Facing his sport and mortality, Yes, but he's also still probably grieving the death of his child. So I think perhaps that's why the pundits have been giving him a bit of leeway. Not a football fan, but can only imagine how the death of a child takes its toll. And absolutely, absolutely agree with right. that as well. Pretty horrendous circumstances for him too. 
Uh, now, we've got a message in here as well about endometriosis, and we are going to be talking about that next if you'd like to get in contact because it is very much a thing that's finally being talked about, but that wasn't for years because one in every 10 women in Ireland, that is a huge amount of people, they will be diagnosed with endometriosis. Those are only the people that are going for diagnosis. Some people just live with it. After the break, we meet the 22-year-old who put up with severe pain for a decade before doctors finally took her seriously. We'll be chatting to you about that very shortly. You're very welcome back. Now, endometriosis is a hidden condition affecting one in 10 women. And I, I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> With the fight for a diagnosis taking up to 10 years for many. Our next guest was recently diagnosed with stage three. There are only four stages, by the way, endometriosis, Lauren Byrne, who joins us now alongside a GP specialising in women's health, Dr. Aoife Nick Howron. Thank you both so much for being here. And right. Lauren, what you've gone through, we're going to get to that in one second. But Perfect. Aoife, for an awful lot of people, we've started to hear the word endometriosis when I was in my 20s. I think it was starting to come, but before that, absolutely not. What exactly is it? So endometriosis, it's, it's almost the great mimicker. It's a disease where you get the lining of the womb and it's formed outside the womb. It, it, it kind of, it, it sits there. So the endometrial tissue sits outside the womb and it tends to cause a triad of symptoms. So you get this pain during periods, you get pain during sex, and then you get infertility. But it's really a great mimicker. So women come in with chronic pain. So they might just come in with fatigue, exhaustion. They might come in with headaches. And then they often get around 60% get bowel symptoms and about 30% will get bladder symptoms, they get pelvic floor symptoms, so they get all these symptoms and it's really hard to know what it is, so it mimics so many things and that's why patients really struggle with it. And, and Lauren, like, you got this pain at an extremely young age. Yeah, I was 12 when I first kind of realised something wasn't right and it couldn't be a normal pain that every girl goes through or sits, like, puts up with. You were 12 years old, you were in school, you were getting your first period and you were in debilitating pain. Yeah, unfortunately, it was. I was 12 um, and I got my first period and I actually ended up in the children's hospital in so much pain and we didn't know what was wrong. We thought there was something seriously wrong and I was just told it's just um, bad periods and take painkillers a few days coming up to your period and continue them on your period and just... Deal with it. So just take a few painkillers. Yeah. You know, did you feel <laughs> that when you were trying to explain the pain that you were in, that were you just getting brushed off a little bit? Yeah, and especially because I was so young. So anything I said, they were like looking at my parents to find out their, like what they thought about it. Like they don't listen to you. Um, and it's been that way for the last 10 years. Aoife, in, like I, you know, I think an awful lot of time when it comes to periods and very much, you know, my mother's generation is just put up and shut up. Yeah. Don't don't discuss it. It's something that shouldn't be discussed. We're finally getting to a stage where it's normal. We all know about them. But there is one thing about period pain, and that's normalising it. So it sounds like for Lauren, she was told by her doctors and everyone else, this you've just had bad periods, get over it. This is what this is the thing, right? And it, it's really, really common. I suppose the thing and the whole reason we're here today is to get people talking about it. So endometriosis, we don't know why it happens. It can run in families, but we're so used to my mum missed a week of school every month and that was normal. So it's normal. I will just continue. You'll miss school or you won't do sports or you won't do your swimming or your sports because that's just how it is. And, and women are really good at just getting on with things. So we just sit at home with our hot water bottles um, and we just don't go to the GPs. We don't go and get the help um, that's out there. We just don't talk about it. So so Lauren, when did you first hear about endometriosis and start to um, do a bit of research into I it? think I could have been maybe 15 or 16. Um, and so I'd been suffering all them years. And when I got to 15 and 16, I got this new symptom and it was a, a really sharp pain in my side. Um, the first time it happened, it was so sharp that I'd like dropped to the floor, I couldn't stand. And everyone thought my appendix burst. That's how severe of pain I was in. And we had no idea what it was. Um, so I ended up in a &E and between 15 to 17, I was in A&E multiple times and they just give you painkillers and send you off. And one doctor mentioned, oh, it could be endometriosis, but it was only slightly mentioned and that was it. And then I actually knew two girls in my school that had been diagnosed with endometriosis um, when I was like 16, I think. So that's what Kate kind of brought my attention to it and made me start researching it. So then I had to do all the research by myself because the doctors, they don't know. They didn't know what it was or yeah. they didn't know. Like I did the research myself and I found out more information through people on Instagram talking about it. Um, that's how I found out all my information. Uh, and why is why is that, that doctors can't... 
<laughs> diagnose it, Aoife, that it's, it's taken... It's a really tricky one to diagnose. So the usual things, examinations, blood tests, even scans, are usually not very helpful. The only way to get a definitive diagnosis is by an invasive procedure, is by surgery. Um, and I suppose there's access issues and then it's surgery or always it's just yeah. tricky to diagnose. So that's why it, it causes that nine year wait, which most women in Ireland have a delay to diagnosis. Nine years. Nine year wait nine years. of debilitating pain. Mm. So you got surgery. You, you yeah, just had surgery. Just five weeks ago. But that, that wasn't you didn't wait. You had to go and you went private. Oh, yeah. So I was on waiting list, I say, since I was 16 and then the start, I think it was like summer last year, it got really bad and I actually collapsed in work from the pain. Yeah, so it got extremely bad. And once that happened, I was like, right, this isn't normal. Like this can't be normal. So my New Year's resolution was to save up the money and to go private and just get it done. Well, <laughs> do you know, like this is, it's not good enough when you've got one in 10 just being diagnosed in Ireland, women, that's yeah. just diagnosed. And there's way more that probably have it. You went private. Yeah what happens. So it is kind of keyhole surgery, isn't it? Yeah, so it's keyhole surgery, but even that it's keyhole, it's quite a big surgery. People think keyhole and it's like not a big deal. Yeah. But um, so I went in and they normally go in um, just three spots. And I they went into uh, five different spots when they found it. Um, and they removed all of it with excision. So excision is the gold standard for endometriosis, which basically means they go in and they cut it out and they get kind of the root out that's how I'd explain it, instead of ablation, which just burns off the surface level. But this is when they when they went in, Yeah, they discovered that your organs were... Stuck together. They were stuck together. Yeah, I had a few organs that grew adhesions on it, which is basically kind of like a scar tissue that binds your organs together. So that's why I was in so much pain. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and it was found everywhere, like so many different parts. Really? Oh. Yeah, it was like my bladder, um, my, the back of my uterus, uh, my rectum. Um, it was just found everywhere, like everywhere. Yeah. So did it feel almost a relief to, that this to realise this is what's been got? This is where this pain has got. This is why you're going to yeah. your parents all the time and ended up in A and E. Yeah. Um. It did. Like as soon as I woke up from surgery and I looked down and I seen the the five little incisions, I went, okay, they must have found something because it's only supposed to be three normally. Um. So as soon as I seen that, I kind of thought, okay, this is something's gone on and then my surgeon came down and I was still loopy from, like mm -hmm. I couldn't even see straight yet. And he came down and he said, you have stage three endometriosis, we removed it all and these organs are stuck together. And I was still like not really awake yet. So I was lying in the bed and I was in the recovery for about an hour by myself. And in my head, in on a loop, it was just, I have endometriosis, I have endometriosis and this is with me for the rest of my life. That just kept going on in my head. So like, it is a lot to process. And as you do feel relief, like I've finally been listened to, I've finally been heard, like mm. it's not in my head. So it was a relief, but it's also a lot to process. But this is the thing, because you went in, you didn't know, you didn't know you had an idea. Yeah. And then not only do you get the diagnosis, yeah. you also had surgery at the same time to, to the ablation <laughs> to get rid of an awful lot of this. But you have endometriosis for life. Yeah. And an awful lot of this, Aoife, like one of the symptoms is infertility. Like mm. I know friends of mine who are, who put up and shut up with the pain yep. and now they're getting diagnosed with it because they're trying to have babies and they can't. So it's for you, was that a, was that a part of it for you? Yeah. To be like, I need answers now, That's not just the pain. That's why I wanted to get on top of it um, at the age of 22. I wanted to get on top of it now in the future if I want to have kids. Like, so luckily enough, um, when I ha had surgery, he told me it wasn't, it didn't affect my ovaries at the moment or uh, my tubes. So it looks okay on the fertility side for me at the moment, but obviously that can change. And even just being someone who has endometriosis, that can still affect your fertility. Like it's not seen as a ideal place for, yeah. yeah so. And, and to try and get rid of this, you're gonna have to go to have surgery, is it in Romania? Because there's not the facilities here in Ireland to do it. Yeah, so basically in Ireland, there's no actual endometriosis or excision specialist in Ireland. There's not one. So um, unfortunately, I already know in a few years, I'm gonna have to travel abroad just to see the specialists because they'll be able to like tell me more information and I'll be able to know exactly what's gone on and how my body reacted to surgery. It's just, it's just not here in Ireland. This is the sort of thing that Lauren and women like Lauren with endometriosis, have they have it for their lives. You know, this is something you have to keep up with. And it, it's rare you're going to be diagnosed with something after menopause, right? But you were told you're too young for endometriosis. Yeah, at 16, I seen a gynecologist and she told me, no, you're too young, go on the pill.
<laughs> if this clearly isn't the case, you can obviously get no, it in. So endometriosis can affect any age. It typically affects kind of women towards their late teens. And, and then I suppose once you hit menopause, you lose estrogen. Yeah. So then it tends to settle down. But women can have it at any age. And as Lauren says, it affects fertility, but it affects your school. So people miss school, yeah. people miss college. I suppose a lot of our workforce are women. And a lot of these women, they struggle to go to work. They struggle to mind their kids. So and mental health can be a huge okay. issue. And then it has the bowel, the bladder symptoms, the pelvic floor. So it can affect relationships so really it has an impact on, on such a, a, a big part of life and it's to try and get the multidisciplinary approach we need our pelvic floor physios we need your psychologists we need all our complementary therapies um, there just there's one in ten women have this it's a nine-year way to do this so for people who are watching what do you advise them to do? So I suppose it's to talk about it. And I suppose the first thing I tell my patients is get a diary. You can get so many apps and trackers to track what symptoms you're getting, when are they happening, what is precipitating it. And that can be really helpful. And then go to your doctor, talk to your doctor. There's so many good GPs out yeah. there and they want to help and we can help. We can't, I can't do invasive surgery, but we have contraceptive pills. We've got new progestin only pills that have just come out and there's a new one coming as well that can help. We've got marina coils, we've got implants, yeah. we've got depots. They're not everything. And for unfortunately for stage three and four, we do need specialist input, but we have things we can do. Yeah. So it's all about talking. It's about getting help. Please don't don't ignore and it. And know in your body. Yeah. Know in your yeah. body and don't ignore it. Like this whole normalising of, of pain. Yeah. It's not like there's these this, these machines now. I'm out for Alan to, to use one that you can put on so that men can feel the pain that women have <laughs> during their periods. But yeah. you did have to give up your job. Yeah. Because of... The, unfortunately, like, yeah. I Like the amount of school I missed, the amount of college I missed and then unfortunately my job. So I was in a quite a physical job. I loved, I loved it. I was a massage therapist basically and it just wasn't ideal and I actually lost my job after collapsing. Um, I lost my job and I've had to take an at-home, work-from-home desk job. Yeah. It's my only solution and I'm only 22. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, Lauren, fair play to you for coming on this morning and talking about it as well because I think... Five you weeks post-surgery, by the way. <laughs> like, well. Fair amazing. play to you. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, thank you so Lauren much. Lauren Byrne, of course, thank you very much. And uh, Dr Aoife Nakairon, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Now there's nothing like a good bowl of vegetable soup no. to kind of warm you up. And Jack Keith has nothing like a bowl. Of <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, was Jack, I thought, oh, good steak on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. Bo, you're making minestrone soup. Now, we have to start, before we start, you had, you were growing your own vegetables, and this was your, this we were saying your wonky carrot earlier on. There, have a look at the, have a look at Jack. What's what? left it was, on wonky yeah, carrot? You had, you have um, it cut huge. it up. huge. There, look at look that. At, you grew right. that yourself. While it was missing in lint, it hadn't girt. Okay. Now, no, okay, listen. let's not go there now. <laughs> you okay. brought it there. <laughs> now, here's, we asked for sending some of your pictures. Anne uh, McHugh from Delgany sent in her heart-shaped wonky carrots. Look at that. Oh, look at those. Very nice, Anne. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, there's a carrot's got legs for days. <laughs> 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 I'd be happy to send legs like that. <laughs> Kira sent in two pictures of our kids with giant creations. First up is Tig in 2017 with his giant. Oh, look at oh that courgette. Goodness. That's look a giant courgette. At look at that. And here's a picture of her daughter Michaela with another giant court. Look at that. Nearly the size of her. Know, I ended up on the front of the local paper in Monaghan once. For what? With me and my sister with two of the biggest mushrooms I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Did you grow them? Obviously we were on the front. Did you grow the, them? The Northern Standard in Manon. Look at you. <laughs> These... Made him, making it big at such a young age. I've got to find that picture. I'd oh, I actually yeah. I'm going to blow it up with a T-shirt. The two of us. We got taken out of school, primary school and all to go off and get our picture with taken. With your mushrooms. Yeah. Um, OK, you've got right. four and a half minutes now. We've wasted <laughs> two and a half Challenge now. Challenge accepted. Waste. Right, min minestrone, really simple. And look, with everything that's going on at the moment as well, it's super cheap. Like I was saying to you, Alan, off air, for me, I think this whole dish, this whole thing this morning, two full pots of this has probably cost me about three or four euro because pretty much everything has come from my garden. Because you grow it. Squash, oh. onion, celery, everything except for the squashes, parsnips. The size hey, of them. Yeah. And that was a baby one. Like there's a video on my Instagram from yesterday of me shopping for these in the back garden and there's one is like that lint. all just grow them in the garden, Jack. Like, I don't I mean, grow it either. I'm a busy person. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm but, a lovely landlord. But you're encouraging people to do that because I <laughs> yeah, suppose look, it does help. 
and go to your local farmer's market on a Saturday. You know right. what I mean? So you're getting really good quality veggies, really good for you as well. Now, some pancetta goes into a, a hot pan with oh. some extra virgin olive oil, Yum. a What's cinnamon that? stick. A cinnamon stick. And some fennel seeds to give that nice autumnal, wintry kick. In on top of this, I'm going to add my veggies, whatever you want. Onion, celery, butternut squash, carrot, celeriac, parsnip. Doesn't matter, right? And so loads of garlic. minestrone soup just a mixture of vegetables? Like, like, like with, the, with the Italians, it's obviously a rule. It's a peasanty type food. Yeah, you can use whatever you want. If you look up a cookbook, guaranteed there's a prescribed set of what vegetables you have to buy the law of the Italians. But I'm from Cork, I don't care. That's the Irish rule. It's like the Irish <laughs> stew kind of. Yeah. Just lump whatever it you want. In. Like, I couldn't find any celeriac yesterday in the supermarket, so I just used parsnip instead. Right? Yeah. So so what's celeriac? Like, Celeriac's like the ugly looking turnip. It's actually the root of a celery. And it has that nice celery uh, kind of flavour. If you go into a restaurant, yeah, you get it. I get to see a celeriac soup and you're going, would you ever just do an ordinary? I hate when these restaurants Fancy, gone yes. too fancy. Yeah, I agree. Celeriac soup isn't fancy. No, but like, uh, is it not okay? No. Well, that's what anyway. they're trying, like, they always put something stupid on it. I do like the celeriac soup. Choke. It is do you? Choked, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a real nice autumnal veg. Once all that veg gets nice and cooked off in the bacon, it starts to soak up all that lovely bacon fat Pretty and flavour, right? Tomato paste. Pop it in about three or four tablespoons, like so. Okay. Good chunk of brown sugar, just to bring brown out the natural sugar. Yeah, just to make it sweeter, bring out that kind of. Now, if you didn't have brown flavor, sugar at home, castor or granulated sugar, whatever you make a cup of tea with. Oh. Okay. Little splash of balsamic vinegar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mix it all together. Give that about three or four minutes, just to cook off a little bit, and then we're going to add in some vegetable stock, and that's just boiling water and an oxo cube, and that's it. Pour it in. Realistically, I should have a little bit more. Just up to, just enough to cover the veggies. Bring it up to a simmer. Once yeah. it simmers, yeah. get some spaghetti. Or this is a great way. Do you never have like the, the ends of bags of pasta all over that cabinet? Yeah. Oh, yes. Where it's not enough for a portion. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just throw them all in. What I do is actually leave them in the bag, get a rolling pin and smash them up into little bits and pieces. I tagged the telly last night that I had in the press for about a month. Yeah. But it still worked. It was yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, so yeah. for this, all I'm doing is taking just normal spaghetti, breaking it up, putting it in. I have loads of half bags of pasta. Yeah. It's yeah, the best exactly. way ever, and it's nice and filling as well. Lid on, bring it to the boil, cook that for about 10 minutes, and it's done. 10 minutes, that's, that's it. it. That's right. it. It's done in 10 minutes. Pasta and the veggies are all cooked down together. Everything is done in 10 yeah. minutes. And would you be better whizzing it then? Or no, leave, leave it chunky, leave it rustic, right? Okay. And when the pasta's almost cooked, you can get some curly kale in the supermarket, or if you have in your garden some cavanero, which is black kale, just slice it up nice and thin, like so. Stalks and everything. Pick it up, scoop it in. Lid down, right? Okay. Look at this one. Now, look, oh, hey, wow, look up. at that. Look at this. Spaghetti has gone nice and cooked. Oh, All the veggies are just literally falling apart. And all I did was I just, just taste it. And if it needs a bit more sweetness, add a little bit more sugar. If it needs more sour, add a little bit more balsamic and a pinch of salt. And that's more it. More sugar. No, like, I never know. Oh, Should I taste Do you know when a chef says season to taste? Yeah. yeah. We always mean sugar as well. Sugar, lemon juice and salt. Always. And no because pepper. Because you're creating this. Not salt and pepper. You know, not really pepper, we wouldn't include pepper. I have a rule, when I used to be a, a, a chef teacher, I used to tell students, if you walk into a kitchen and they already have the salt and the black pepper mixed oh, together right. in a bowl, just walk out. It's not the place for you to learn. Oh, really? Because oh. right. the pepper burns juice. when you're cooking. Lemon juice, always. You're balancing salty, sweet yeah, and sour salty, constantly. Right. Now, a ladle okay. and scoop that out. I like this okay. is perfect for families. It's perfect for meal prep. <laughs> Now, Alan, oh, that's wow. yours. Here. My God, look at that, Tommy. I Very love funny. the little pancetta. Yeah, me too. Is, is yeah. the pancetta normally in... It's not a classic, oh, no. Oh, I was going to say that, because I wouldn't have thought so. Ash, look, I'm unique, Alan. I know, Just you like certainly that carrot. are, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear him big slurp <laughs> of you? <laughs> I was thinking uh, about Jack. Yeah, here, that's, uh, that's gorgeous, isn't it? The, the sugar on it is really nice. See, the sugar brings yeah. out the natural sweetness yeah, in the does, veggies. Yeah. You know, you can add anything to it. It's absolutely brilliant. It's and great. the next day, it's even better. I know I say that about every stew, but the next day, that is I class. love a stew the next day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's really lovely. Crusty bread. bread. Oh, wow. Isn't it? Yes, Where's the nice crusty bread? At home. I ate it on the way in. The yeah, car. right. Jack, <laughs> gorgeous. Thank you so no much. Problem. It really is delicious. It's too really hot. You do even it? need steak, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your cheeseburger Burn the last tongue week. off you. Mm. Okay, after the it's break, really Derek will be really getting good. a Halloween fried mm. on a family friendly forest trail. See you in a few minutes. It's really tasty. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM.
Thanks for staying with us now. Our wandering weatherman is easing into the spooky season with his latest adventure. Derek is surrounded by ghosts and ghouls this morning, Derek, yes? Absolutely, Al. Come here. We're having a bit of a strange morning here in Lowgood, Sagar, South West County. We're joined now by Pete the Better. First up, Pete, I want to say congrats on Hell Week. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, before we get into Hell Week, right, let's talk about Pete the Builder. I mean, you've had a fantastic show and a new season coming up, haven't you? Yeah, so um, doing a new season of Home Rescue, so we're in season five now, so all going, all going good and uh, really looking forward to helping people out around the country again. And you're getting in to people's homes every nook and cranny and there's so many home disasters isn't there? Yeah, basically people hand, hand over their keys to us and um, we set up the design team go in and we rearrange most of their house for them and uh, sort out a lot of the problems that they have maybe with design and declutter the house as well. And what's your favourite thing in terms of house design then? What do you look at? What do you? It's great to give light and space into a house, you know, we see that a lot when we go into people's homes, the wrong colours and just sort of simple mistakes design wise can really sort of close your house in. So creating a bit of space oh my part's falling down <laughs> uh, creating a bit of space and uh, getting light into into a home is, it can really dramatically change the whole features you and know? you worked with Dermot Bannon for eight seasons I did for my scenes yes you. yeah God love me yeah, yeah I did. how was that I was great yeah Dermot's, Dermot's uh, a, good, a good lad he's, he's good old fun but uh, he he's likes a bit of a head melt isn't he <laughs> <laughs> I know Darren's a good man, but he, he likes to uh, to throw a lot on the builder, you know. I don't worry the builder will look after that, you know. So he likes to go over the budget as he well. He does. I know you had a bit of a row with him, so people seem to like that as well, you yeah, know. I we like a bit of row on yeah, TV. Yeah, you like a bit of drama, adds, you know. That's to the drama. <laughs> now, Hell Week, obviously I did it two years ago, you did it this year, this yeah. season. You're just off it. How was it? Yeah, it was it was great. It was really tough, and like as you know, um, it's I wouldn't call it a life changing experience, but you definitely won't forget it for a long time, you know. It was it was brilliant. Um, obviously, you go to places you've never been before, mentally and physically. Physically, but to get to do it for charity, and my charity was the Children's Health Foundation, so I was uh, delighted to be able to do that. And you're, you're a pretty fit lad. I know oh, you're, you're into you. your adventure racing, you're into your outdoor sports. Yeah. Uh, like, so you went into it like, pretty well prepared, Pete. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, look, uh, as soon as I was asked, I, I said yes straight away, and I got a lot of good training in, and that really stood to me in there. But it's very hard, as you know, to, to actually train for Hell Week because it's so diverse and mm. they put you into so many difficult situations. But uh, and I, I really did enjoy it, and I, I made sure when I was there to try and absorb it and trying to actually, actually take it all in because, you know, there's so much going on in such a and short period of time. And speaking of absorption, because you took on a lot of mud. <laughs> I was sitting at home watching that mud challenge and I was like, God, love them. God, love them. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the kind of uh, the mud pack that I was looking for, you know, for my skin. It was, uh, I know it was, it was actually a really cool event. They dragged us through all sorts of different crazy uh, situations in Scratch and roared and screamed. Did all, the, all the usual thing that those lovely yeah. DSs do, you know. And, like, people think it's for the cameras. It is not. Oh. Oh. It is not for the cameras. No, it never stops. It never stops. Mm. They just like they're on you uh, right from the, the first minute. And if you make a mistake or you're doing something wrong, you hear about it straight away. And you, you know? nearly but made it's it on the hike, didn't you? Yeah, oh. I got very close, very close. I, I made it right up. I actually uh, finished the hike, but I was just a few minutes outside the time, so I didn't go into the final day. But I was very happy with how I did. And I was ten years younger than and all as you them. Mentioned, yeah. All for a good cause. Halloween. Yeah. Let's talk about your favourite movie. Favourite movie, uh, 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 Who Be Halloween um, by Adam Sadler oh, is actually brilliant. It's hilarious, yeah, and hilarious. of course, you've got three girls at home. Uh, I so do, do you yeah. like playing Halloween games? What did you do for oh, Halloween I'm games? All, I'm always getting dressed up. They put all sorts of stuff in my hair and all the rest. Well, I love being Dracula, actually. I chase the kids around the house. Uh, uh. <laughs> and trick-or-treating, like, trick-or-treating's great. Did you still do it? Yeah, absolutely. I, with three young girls, we go trick-or-treating all the time. And... Uh, Kids love dressing up and coming to bring the fence like Lugwoods as well. It's great, you know. Just like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I know you didn't make it on heavy, but you know what? Here's your prize money. Actually, oh. did your parents be here this morning? Hey. Here we go. Hey. I'm a winner. <laughs> He's a winner. Back to you guys in the studio. Congrats, Pete. Hot of gold. Thank you very much. Cheers. Go, man. <laughs> oh. There you go. Thank you very much, Derek. Now. Are you feeling creepy? I, I'm getting, I will slowly get into it as the week goes on. I thought you were going to take offence at that. We're actually in Kilmain, or not Kilmain Jail, uh, Wicklow. Wicklow Jail on Thursday. On Thursday. Yes, Poor Wicklow Tommy, Jail on Thursday. Tommy's devastated. He's Mr Halloween around here. Now, coming up in the final hour of Ireland AM, AM we're talking fish fixing, <gasps> fashion and creepy crafts. More Ireland AM is on the way after this quick break.
that is absolutely mad. Like, we haven't mentioned it all morning, but fair play <laughs> to those ones. Fine, Derek. Yeah. I and, mean, in fairness, we haven't mentioned. They've been there just doing all this day. since 7 o'clock this morning. Oh, well done. Them. I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming they're college students and they're just on their way home from a night out. <laughs> like, so, you know. Fancy dress um, last night. It's all night. good to go. Uh, Where yeah. is he actually all morning? In Dublin. It's in Sagers. Sagers. In Lugwood. Dublin. Lugwood. Lugwood. Yeah, that's yes. it. Uh, now, we were just speaking uh, a little while ago. Lauren, who's a 22-year-old who just had surgery um, after 10 years of debilitating pain, and she was finally, five weeks ago, diagnosed with endometriosis. And also, uh, we had uh, a doctor in as well, Aoife, uh, who specialises in women's medicine she about endometriosis. She so well about it, Lauren, she? Yeah. she was fantastic. And debilitating. her boyfriend was outside with, a, with such a proud smile on his face. Oh, she was so nice. good, mm. but like to have sorted this out because there's so many messages in, a message that said, I suffered with endometriosis since the age of 12. For years, doctors told me it was just bad period pain. Uh, I ended up going private for surgery in London. My surgeon told me the majority of his patients are coming from Ireland for treatment because there are so few specialists. There's two available here. This is a major issue which needs to be looked at by the government and more helps need to be offered. And that, um, there was a scheme under which you could go to the UK for treatment for endometriosis and that's Brexit. ended now because of Brexit. Yes, that's why you say Lorna had to go to she Turkey? She to Romania. No, Romania. No, no, she because is. she can't go to London anymore because she can't get money back and it's just... She and because she can't get the treatment here in Ireland. I mean, Tina's yeah. just said my daughter has been to the doctor throughout the year as she thinks she has it. They sent her for a scan and it came back clear because the scan, of course, the as scan won't show that you've got endometriosis. And they told her that it's just bad period pain. She has all the symptoms that that girl had. I mean, it's frightening to think that... One in ten women have this. Diagnosed, yeah. Also, it can take ten years for a diagnosis. Can I ask you, do we know why it can't be treated in Ireland? Because we've got two specialists. No, it can be. It's just we've got two specialists and the queue is nine years. Oh, yeah. my God. That's the God. issue. It can be done. We just don't have... And Lauren, she had to go So you go she on go a private. queue for nine years to see a specialist. A waiting list, yeah. Mm. Oh, my God. It can take up to... And it can get... Because of uh, they have to rule out everything else beforehand. Like it's the this, last thing scans that and... you kind of get so to. So this so girl, Tina, probably... Uh, Tina's daughter could have it and a scan is not showing it up. No, no, no. no. A scan can't show it up. And what Lauren had to do, she had to go private yeah. to have the surgery. So Tina, if she wanted to go private, she and might be able to And would your health insurance that. cover it? No. It, well, oh, yeah, I'm sure that, like, if it's on your insurance. Health insurance probably would. Um, yeah, delighted. that's what I'm saying. The health the insurance government cover. wouldn't for... No. Uh, there's loads of messages in about this as well, by the way. Just thank you to everyone who did get in contact and we realise this is something that absolutely does need to be talked about more. Like... Everything in our health well, system, really, isn't it? Well, I think really, this uh, next topic is going to get uh, people interested as well because coming up next, Irish dancing has been compared to the mafia. I've been <laughs> bed into this. <laughs> We're going to discuss fish fixing and the future of the sport after the break. Go to the mattresses. <laughs> horses' heads in beds. I'll talk to you in a second. Welcome back. Now, you ready? Ready for this? I'm going to try to pun this up. Let's do it. Now, the Irish dancing world was left reeling after... Oh, he doesn't like it. After dramatic <laughs> cheating allegations <laughs> caught the attention of everyone from the government to the global press. Reeling. A reel. Oh, yeah. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Lost on the rugby player. Lost on me completely, yeah. Okay. A real Irish independent dance. journalist Ellen Coyne broke the story and she's sharing the latest alongside former professional Irish dancer Louise Hayden, who is in Donegal this morning. Louise, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll come to you in just a second. Uh, Ellen, tell us what's a real. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy my fun? I enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you very much, Ellen. Good. Cheers. I thought it was sorry, good. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, tell us what made you delve into the world of Irish dancing. I thought that it was untouchable. Yeah, and I suppose I would have thought so too. And like a lot of people, I would have thought that it was a wholesome hobby that children engaged in. And it's also something that I suppose as a country, we'd be really proud of. But um, a couple of weeks ago, at around 10 o'clock at night, I got this weird email from an anonymous account with a Dropbox file. And when I opened it, what it showed was these kind of screenshot texts going between Irish dance teachers and judges. Um, and from putting it together, we learned and reported uh, the next day in the Irish Independent that uh, on Comishoon La Rinke Gaelica, which is the biggest, oldest and most prestigious Irish dancing organisation in the world, had been handed these files in July, which appeared to show a systemic cheating problem. Now, the CLRG didn't appoint a judge to investigate those claims until September, which is a couple of months later, after they started to 
leak online and were being shared all over the internet on these kind of Irish dancing gossip forums. Now, what's come from this is obviously um, a judge-led investigation, a disciplinary process within the CLRG, but more than that, a lot of people from the world of Irish dancing coming forward and saying, this has been an open secret for a long time and as far as they're concerned, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And let's talk about what this fesh fixing looks like, because it is dancing teachers who are uh, trading what in order to get their dancers for a spot or to, to get them up the rank. It's a really interesting question because in these messages, you can't see anybody talking about the exchange of money. Yeah. But basically what happens is there seems to be kind of these allegiances between some of the really top, really prestigious Irish dance teachers, not just in Ireland, but in the US, the UK and all over the world. And what they will basically do is set up these relationships where some Irish dancing teachers are accredited to be adjudicators, which means they can judge prestigious competitions like the all Ireland's or the world's, what would happen is these teachers would text judges ahead of the competition and say, can you look after a student X, Y, Z? Sometimes they might even say she'll be wearing this costume, she'll have this marker on her. And what people get from that is if you're an Irish dance teacher with a school that has a certain amount of world champions, a certain amount of all Ireland champions, you become more prestigious. You can probably charge a lot more and you can also be brought into other schools and earn thousands from uh, doing choreography. Uh, Louise, you're a, a former professional Irish dancer who has toured the world and, and reaped the benefits, I suppose, of what Irish dancing can offer. Are, were you surprised? When you saw this le no, you're shaking your head. Tell us there more. Is nobody, there is nobody in the Irish dancing world right now that is surprised by this. This is not new. This has gone on for years. And, you know, this would have even had gone on back when I was um, competing, which is probably only a few years ago. Um, but it's gone on for a while. Um, and like we say, it's, it's like an unspoken thing. Um, but, you know, it's not something that, all, this is not what all teachers do. This is not across the board. And it's worth noting that because there are so many teachers out there that have far higher morals than that work hard. The, the kids work really hard. And it's just such a shame that on all those children, um, it, it's a shame for the children involved in this as well because their names are, are out there publicly and they work hard as well. So the fact that they have having to be brought, dropped to that level. It's stupid and it, it's just not fair. But Louise, then I'm just wondering, for years and years and years, you've got professional Irish dancers like yourself who managed to make a career out of it, whether in river dancer or, or Lord of the Dance. And, and I mean, you know, traveling to China, uh, going to places like South Korea, America, it is a proper legitimate job. But you must be sitting there then having chats about people who were won certain competitions and you're you're obviously going, well, I don't think they deserve to win it. And it's something that you all, there must be a lot of anger within the community. There is, and I mean, I've even seen, um, you know, when this news broke, I saw a post actually from a girl that's local here um, and she kind of told her story. It's almost like people have started to go, well, we can actually say it now. So you know, we can say, I know this happened this time and I know this happened. And people recalling stories that, you know, where they felt disappointed. Um, and, and like, like the Irish dancing is such a close-knit community. So everyone's very careful about what they say because they don't want to offend each other and then in somehow face the reco reco reper repercussions of that. Um, it's a tricky one. For anyone within the community, like I'm on the outside looking in, I used to teach, I don't teach anymore. Um, so that's probably why I feel like I can speak a bit more openly. I'm on here now. Um, but so many people are scared to kind of say anything too loudly in case they kind of have any fallback for it, you know? Uh, for parents, Louise, I mean, Irish dancing, the amount of money parents have had to spend on dresses, on wigs, on tans, on everything else, to then find out that there's actually cheating going on, whether your daughter or son is even going to get a ward. I mean, where is the sport now, in your opinion? I mean, it's, it's devastating for kids, isn't it? But, you know, my children dance um, and they're very young. They're only beginners and, we, you know, we take it very loosely. We're not kind of, we're not deep into the whole kind of competitive world of Irish dancing. Um, I think it's down to the individual. I think, you know, Yes, you're spending an awful lot of money, but there's other hobbies that you're spending an awful lot of hobby on as well, you know. Um, I think I think as a parent, yes, it's going to be very upsetting to think that you've spent a lot of money to travel, because there's a lot of travelling involved with these competitions. And if you've spent a lot of money to travel somewhere and you don't think you've been judged fairly, 
I mean, what uh, what can be done about it other than this this or, um, investigation really needs to kind of really do some justice and not just give everyone a slap on the wrist and brush it under the carpet. There needs to be more done. Everyone everyone has been saying this needs to have been done for years. It can't be just like, oh, let's just have a ban on adjudicating for a small period of time and move on. There should be permanent, like, implications from this. And Ellen, two people, and it's not saying that they were involved in this in any way, but two people did step down from the uh, CLRG uh, just last week. As Louise said there, like, it's been compared to the Mafia. It's very close-knit community. Everyone knows every everyone and they're afraid of repercussions. So it does need to be kind of blown open in this way because, you know, there was an interview in the paper with a woman who spent €20,000 in one year for her children going all over the place, right? Yeah, that's right. And I suppose the problem people have now is that this specific investigation is just on like a dozen teachers and judges. And as everyone from the world of Irish dancing has said, it's a lot broader than that. And I think a lot of people are now getting the sense that if there is some sort of, if those people are found guilty of cheating and there is maybe like a lifetime ban on them and that's it, then this will have achieved nothing. And there's a real anxiety in the world of Irish dancing that if this opportunity is missed, there will never again be an opportunity to kind of clean up the world of Irish dancing. Like this scandal is being described as the biggest thing to happen to Irish dancing since Riverdance. But obviously this is a very negative thing to happen wow. to Irish dancing. And I suppose the problem is the CLRG, it is a massive global organisation. Um, there's huge concerns about the reputational damage this has done to Ireland, but the CLRG doesn't get any state funding. So while you will have people like Leo Varadkar or Catherine Martin, the Arts Minister, saying they have real anxiety about this, people are wondering, like, is there any scope there to have an external independent investigation? Because people worry that if this investigation is being led by the CLRG itself, is it going to get to the heart of the matter? And it's, is it going to clean up but, Irish dancing forever? And is there an element here, because we talk about this all the time, and it's the way, like, we looked at my, my niece's Irish dancing dress in comparison to what my sister's was. Like, my niece's came just to there, my sister's came just above the knee. There's all this fake tan for the white girls who were involved, these massive wigs. It feels like toddlers and tiaras, and it's become something that it's not. Certainly as someone from the outside looking in, you know, it's kind of sexualised in a certain way now. It feels like it's gone away. Is that something that's talked about within the community? I mean, something that has certainly uh, come up when I've been working on this is when you have Irish dancing in Ireland, it wouldn't be uncommon for someone who's a primary or secondary school teacher to be an Irish dance teacher in their spare time. In America, if someone is an Irish dancing teacher, that's their full-time job. It's a business. And you would have arrangements where someone might make a lot of money making really expensive costumes or dresses that could be six, seven, eight thousand euro, who then might sponsor competitions that their own students are oh. competing in. So you have all of these arrangements. I mean, there's a lot of people making a lot of money out of Irish dancing and it maybe wouldn't suit them to go to a so sort of river dance style arrangement where you just have like a black pair of tights and a very simple costume. There's a whole industry around this. This is a multi-million euro global industry that goes much farther than what is a very elite sport and also an art form and something with a lot of culture. Absolutely. It sounds like um, what you're saying, Ellen. Uh, there's a lot more beneath the surface. I'm sure there's a lot more to come out as well. Listen, uh, Alan Coyne from the Irish Independent, of course, you broke the story. And Louise Hayden, a former professional Irish dancer, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Joining us from... Uh, <laughs> you were looking at the gym and Donegal. Donegal. Oh, God, I must find out where that gym is. Gym, and, and up there. Right. Thank you so much for joining us both this morning. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again about it. Um, no Ellen. Now, up next, Bank Holiday Styles on the catwalk. It's the Bank Holiday and DIY decorations for Halloween. Uh, yes, yeah, stay with us. We have plenty more coming up after the break. Hello, today's fashion is all about looks for reminder. It's a long weekend. And you'd forgotten. And so weekend. would I. There we go. There we long go. From cosy country walks to a night on the tiles. We prefer a night in the tiles. Uh, Rob Condon, well, speaking for myself, <laughs> oh, Rob yeah. Condon is here with some stylish ops and options. Good, Good morning. morning to you, Rob. Yes, we've got lots of stylish options. So whether you're kind of taking a cosy uh, country escape or whether it's a city break, we have you sorted from going out at night time to what you'd wear maybe travelling to exploring what the city has to offer. I'm oh, just saying Lovely. your weekend sounds fantastic, Rob. <laughs> not doing anything. Okay, my let's start off with Sarah. <laughs> yes, we're starting off with Sarah here. All of the clothes just 
Osborne are available from CC Boutique, dresses online at .ie. We've accessories from Next. With this, it's all about this coat. It really is, yeah. Yeah, it's all it's about so cozy, cozy looking, I comfy. I want to wear it. <laughs> exactly, cozy and comfy. Really great um, shoulder detail to it. You can see the attention to detail in the design of it. It's quite a box fit to it, but you can see there's lots of shape as well. So the way it's um, emphasized the waistline there, there's pockets, it's double breasted, really dramatic um, lapel detail as well to it. I think with this coat, you want to go simple underneath it because it's making quite a statement yeah. to the print. So keeping it quite simple with a black tee, black jeans. But it is that coat that comes out each season that oh, you're yeah, going to get so much years. wear out of. Yeah. As Christmas comes up, if you're dressing up, Don't going out to a party. It's sunny October. <laughs> <laughs> Early November. Um, if you're going out to a party over the shoulders with a dress, it would also look great. Is it warm, Sarah? Are you boiling? Sweet. Yeah, okay, I thought that, that would be it as well. <laughs> um, then we've gone with a simple pair of black skinny jeans here. They're high-waisted black skinny jeans. I just love it with that kind of black base underneath mm. it. But you could bring a little bit of colour to it. You could go with burgundies underneath it. Or, as I say, a sequins dress with this over it. We'll It'll have you a party ready. Well. Yes, all of our shoes this morning are available from Tiffany Shoes, which are based in Kilkenny and Adair in Limerick. Really great pair of shoes. I think these are great shoes if you're running around a city, that there's a little heel to them, so you're still stylish at the same time. They've got that chain detail to them. They are a sock boot as well. Sock boot, lovely, yes. and that J.W. Anderson sort of thing going on. Sarah, yeah. thank you so much for that. Look number two, Marwa is wearing look that this morning. Look number two. So we've gone a little bit versatile with this. Look, if you're someone who wants to pack light and you want a look that's going to take you from daytime to evening time, this is definitely going to do that. With changing from trainers into boots, it's going to do that. With the blouse here, it's all about a feminine silhouette to this dress floral print, there's a black base to this. You can see the pleating detail into the shoulder. It's an A-line shirt, an A-line blouse even. Yeah. So it's gonna be great for body shape. So you're gonna get that coverage because it is A-line um, with that. Now I think it's quite Olivia Palermo with the leather um, trousers here because they are kind of sports looks vibe to these. But what she would do is put a feminine print with it, and that's what we've done this morning. Lovely. With them, they are high waisted as well. They're drawstring, so they do have that really sports looks vibe to the waist of these. And quite comfy, uh, yeah, with trousers. those as well. Yeah, you could change the look around as well if you want to go with like a crew t shirt, bomber jacket, trainers. It's going to make it that much bit bag. more sports looks. Then with the bag, it's quilted bag, leather bag, gold chain detail. So if you change the bag on this, it's going to make it a lot more casual if you're going with an over the shoulder bag. But by putting a clutch with it, you're just just dressing it up for a night out. Yeah, and you've got it. They've got uh, it's stopping just above the ankle. So again, perfect for the runners if you want to wear yes, them with the runners as well. Exactly. You put them with the boots. You've added um, jewellery as well. Oh, we're looking at the boots. With the boots, there they are. 119 for the boots. You can see the gold buckle detail yeah, to the side of them. Nice. Really great, great pair of boots. There is, mm. but it's quite a thick heel as well that you're going to have that comfort as well. They're going to go great with jeans, dresses, anything for autumn, winter. Then with the jewellery we've accessorised this morning, we have these really statement earrings. They're an oval layered earring. All of the accessories are available from next this morning and we've matched that back in the gold with this necklace. So with the blouse here, you don't want to go with too much of a statement necklace, so I'd keep it quite simple with the necklace to this Love look. the chunkiness on that one, Mara. That is lovely. Thank lovely. you so much. Thank you, Mara. Now, with our next look, we're going a little bit vampy, but still keep it quite feminine at the same time. We're seeing a lot of a gothic vibes this season, and that's what we've done here this morning with this look. I think this is perfect for any staycation you might have coming up, because it is a dress, again, that you're going to be able to throw with trainers, leather jacket, denim jacket, or go with a heel. Very Queens of Archive feel yes. this one. Very yes. good. Um, you can see the slit detail to the side of it there. There's sheer, but it has got an underlining underneath it. The waist detail, and then you've got that button. It's just cutting under the bust of it there. Really V neckline to this sheer sleeve and, um, to it, and then the scalped sleeve to it. But I think that choker detail is really nice. It's so gothic. Yeah, it it's is a little really bit. Bringing it what in. I like about it is because you've got the choker kind of with that gothic, but you've got that kind of feminine vibe as well with the pearl necklace. It's kind of bringing classic to it. It really does. It works really yeah. well together. Yeah. Um, and just that little bag there. with it as well. Then with the bag, we've got it's a kind of burgundy wine bag there. Gold detail, which matches back in with the gold chain on the bag there as well. But I think it just works really well with the colours to this dress. But as I say, you could make this casual for a weekend away by going with a denim shoes. jacket. Now, don't you think you should yes. be wearing those as an eye, as a mask? Yes. <laughs> I'd wear those as a mask. I would. 
they'd look great as a mask. Um, then for the shoes, they're available again from Tiffany Shoes, a really statement pair of shoes. Oh, they have so many amazing pairs of shoes, but I think these are a great pair. You can see it dresses this up straight away yeah. with the shoes, but even going with like a plain black dress, a trouser suit with these would look amazing as well. Blonde, you're fabulous today. Fab shoes, it. Gorgeous, yeah. fantastic. Gorgeous pair of shoes. And our final look today, Sarah Marcy is back. So we are going high octane <laughs> glam oh, no. with this look Lovely. here. So if you are heading away this weekend and you have an event or whether it's a fancy dinner out, you are sorted with this look here. Jumpsuit is making all the statements in the right places here. Slight V-neck line to it there. Then you can see the sleeve detail to it. And you can see the peplum detail, which I love because it's going to suit lots of different body shapes. Because you've got your pocket to the side there where Sarah has her hand in her pocket, but you've got that full coverage with the peplum because it's going full length with it. So it's going to suit so many All the peplum was gone and it is back. No, it's definitely back. It's so it's back of his jumpsuit. Is it yeah. just in this color? It, it, it's available in a few different colors. All right. Yeah. Um, and, and did you add the Belt. Yes, we've added the belt with it this morning, so the gold belt there. Um, but I just love how that peplum drops to the floor and a little bit of a 70s vibe as well yeah. with the trousers to this. Um, and then we have gone with these. I, I love the earrings on this as well. Yeah, exactly. I think with the neckline to this, you don't want to go with a chunky necklace or anything like that. So do it with the earrings. earrings are great. Then, yes. Yeah. Um, gorgeous pair of drop earrings. You've got the pearl detail and the stone and stars with these earrings. Very nice. And then sparky, 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 sparky shoes down yes. at the bottom. So finishing so off with these court shoes. They've got a bow detailing with this um, sparkly design to them. Another great pair of shoes that would go great whether you go with a jumpsuit like this or even with a plain black dress. They're going to work so well. And they're a pair of shoes that you'll take out season and season. They're 150. Fabulous. Nice it's so stuff. unusual. It really yeah. is. It's just like something a little bit different. Would you wear that fabulous. I don't know. It's always uh, with jumpsuits. Yeah. I, I never really know how I'm going to feel about them. I think that'd be lovely on you. That well, do you know what? Maybe <laughs> I'll rub it off there and see if I can if I can get <laughs> one leg in on tomorrow. <laughs> 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 can we get into Sarah's jumpsuit? No, I can't. I can't. Okay, after um, the thank break, thank you. So thank you. Thank you. After the break, we're getting crafty with DIY Halloween decorations. Stay with us. <laughs> I'm so scared. So scared. I'm so scared. <laughs> Look at those wrinkles up close. <laughs> Halloween is fast becoming as big as Christmas when it comes to decoration. And Aileen Hogan from Shabby.ie is here with us some lessons in DIY decor. Good morning Good to you. Good morning. We're all getting into like? the Halloween spirit. And some of this is very simple but so effective. And that's the whole idea because what I found this year, like you just said, people are decorating earlier and bigger. Oh, Halloween's become it's huge. It's become huge. huge. But with Christmas only around the corner, that can be a bit expensive. Yes. So I wanted, I set myself a little mission to see if I could show you and everybody at home that you don't need to spend a fortune. You can use a lot of what you have at home and create really lovely decor. Okay. So I've created porch decor using painted pumpkins. So this is basically just three different sized pumpkins and you've painted them. Painted just black and white. Yeah. Like that's so simple. Look yeah. And nailed them together. Glued no, them? do you know what? They're stuck together with skewers, you know, chicken skewers that you'd oh, put. Yeah, oh, hey, yeah. Glued, yeah. And then yeah. just a few leaves from the garden. Leaves you just put them underneath. Stuck on, stuck on with a hot glue gone. It's really effective. I know a lot of these things, though, because some of these, like this amazing, is there stuff because, of course, if you've got children, you want them to get involved. Yeah. Oh, OK, well, this is why we're going to do this one. So I did two table centre. That's a mummy table centrepiece. This one All here. harvesty, lovely. Yes. But this one you do with the kids. So I'm going to do this one with you guys. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, kids that, makes, today, that makes sense. Right? We'll that do a sense. little bit sure, of it. Take oh, your yeah, broom. These... You've left it here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is called... <laughs> I'm off. Sorry. I've been called a witch plenty of times, lads, <laughs> and worse this, than it. And that is just made from a branch and twigs tied together, by the way. Let's Hello? see. OK, so yeah. branch and twigs. Tied together and sprayed. Spray painted and black. And you spray painted yes. the black. And, you're and rec Alan's wrecking it. Alan's wrecking it. Yeah. yeah. Come on, let's do our okay. thing, let's do our okay. thing, let's do our thing. So this is a table centrepiece. The skulls are two euro from Woody's, okay? The base and is... And other good places. <laughs> and, <laughs> and other good places, that's where I got them. A cake stand, I just bought two euro fifty, you know, yeah. cake base. And these candles are made out of 
kitchen roll holders, toilet roll holders, and it's supposed to be a pool noodle, but I couldn't find a pool noodle, so I use... What's a pool noodle? You know those long things you get in the pool with and they help you float? Uh, Flotation yeah. device. All right. Flotation device. There we go. This actually is an insulation foam for a pipe. Yeah, which you'd get yeah. in any DIY exactly. spot. Exactly. Yeah. So throw that over there. Oh, so you cut them okay. into three or four different heights. Yeah. OK? Spray it all black, stick it all down. These are little battery lights that you get in, well, Tesco. Yeah, you wherever, get them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anywhere. And did you like spray that? those as well? Sprayed them as well. So, now, I kept hold on a top. second. So you have this. Yeah. How does that become this? OK, you take out a little bit across the top. You slot that down into it. But the di only difficult part that people might find in this is creating these drips. You see these drips? They're really effective. It gives the effect oh, of a candle. A candle yes. waxing, melting. Yeah. Now, you can use hot glue on cardboard, but you can't use hot glue on these because you'll melt it. OK. So I used a thing called puffy paint. So I'm going to show you what I did, and then you two are going to have a go. Go okay, for it. Go for it. And then maybe the public can tell us who did best, yeah? Right. <laughs> What's it called? Puffy paint. Puffy paint, yeah. I got it in the range. 160 or something. <laughs> Could it be more perfect, could it? <laughs> She's got a new favourite paint. <laughs> OK, here we go. OK, so I'm just literally squeezing it out, dripping it down, and it puffs up. <laughs> it puffs up, Ellen. Puffs up. Can you see that? Can you see that, Peter? Are you getting that? You are. Or that, you know, you were okay. perfect there where you were. Yeah. OK, so you, you drip it down. Yeah. Yes, and even if you don't spray paint it before, you can spray paint it afterwards. OK. That's as easy, OK? So I'm going to give you that one. OK. And I'm going to give you a white one so we know whose is whose. I know, I'm keeping it so far away from the dress, it's not even funny. Go. Oh, it's not going to come out that fast. OK, go. Oh, so you need to give it a good squeeze. Oh, give squeeze. it a good squeeze. Oh, good bit of puff yeah, on this one. Yeah, and then drip it down. That's it. They look great. Oh, I thought you'd be horrendous at this. This is brilliant. Why did you think I'd be horrendous? Excuse me. He's amazing at puffy paint. Let's see. That's it. That's really good. OK, very long one. Yeah, but... And up, would... up, up, up along the top. Yeah, no, I'm coming to come back to and that. And is this adhesive? So it'll just stick it, to it? Yes, but also it'll take about 24 hours to dry. So all you do is just put it aside and let it dry. And oh, it, right, and OK. And dry is really thick. And even okay, if so you there get... you go. Yeah. There we go. There's my one there. If what you get... do you think? Melted candle there, Pete. Yeah, looks it's, like it was melting. Yeah, it. There oh, we go. very good. So, so if you get which um, one is best? And your oh, yours is very good as well, Moran. Well, yeah. I went the whole way around. You went the whole I'm way the around. Best, okay. I'm the best girl. Okay, in the world. you're the best girl. So can these um, this can be spray painted as well. Spray painted and cheap spray paints, three ninety nine. You do not spend big money on this. All the paints I used, two euro, one euro fifty. Keep it to a budget. Use your cheapy shops. Your yeah. Euro saver shop. And safe with all your kids? Safe with, with all, all the kids. Oh, yeah, these are all kid friendly craft stuff from uh, Mr. Price. Now, we didn't see it earlier on. You were saying this is very much the mammy one, the centre yes. table. Can we just talk about this then? Yeah. And, and what these are you've all done things there. from your garden. So I did a lazy Susan. So you see here? So it actually oh, turns. Yeah. Oh, but you can lovely. just use a chopping board. OK. And then it's moss from the laneway near my house. Some pine cones. These are cheap little squashes. One seventy nine from your local supermarket. And I suppose Halloween, it's all about that outdoor stuff coming in. Absolutely. So you don't even have to go off and buy anything. Because it's harvest time yes. as well. So bring all that in and it's the colour of it. Now, I also invested in expensive stuff like these garlands, these rag dolls, but these come out every year. OK, yes. you buy so, once. Now, exactly. you have okay. to tell us about this. This is genius. Tell us Put how you did this. Put it up there into this. your hand. That is a napkin. No, we have it there. We'll get a shot yep. of it there. Because this is a just a pumpkin that you bought, but this is a napkin. Yes. Three-ply napkin, take the back two layers off, and you're left with the printed, very thin Clean. layer. Glue it onto your surface. Another part, um, layer of glue, and it sinks in, and it looks like it's part just of it. Just not paint the glue on, put it glue on, put glue. it all around it, and then Craft glue it again. glue. So yes. you could get any it's kind of a napkin. It's called decoupage. That's yeah. crazy, like, yeah. Halloween yeah. I did it with my friends on Saturday. They weren't impressed, but I thought they it was They weren't impressed. <laughs> I know, Alan. They thought that? they were coming over for a glass of wine. They well, didn't think I they were going to do decoupage. I even gave them cocktails and they still weren't happy. Oh, well, no. Oh, that's you must not... have very, no, hard to please friends because <laughs> I think that's very impressive. See now. that? Hot.
Heart, please. There friends. you go. Heart, please, friends. So you're obviously putting up some of this stuff. Shabby.ie is where it's, people Oh, can find this it. tutorial is up this morning on Instagram. Yes. And all the others. She sits on the broom. Look, hanging in a tree. She'll be up tomorrow morning. There we go. Sitting on the broom like yeah. that. Yeah. Happy as Larry. Done. Can Done. make all that stuff yourself. Yeah. Thank there you we so go. much, Julian Hogan. Thank you so much for joining us. Love it. All looks absolutely great. Looks fantastic. We'll be doing that, won't we? Tommy, did you ever do your puffy paint? <laughs> no, I'm not much good at the puffy paint, but I like that with the pumpkin, though. Yes, it's very good. A lot easier than carving them out. I spent all day yesterday carving <laughs> three pumpkins, but uh, well done, Al. I think yours was the best. Fair play to you. <laughs> Right, come on. Uh, coming up on tomorrow's show, we're going to be talking to broadcaster Adrian Childs as he opens up about his battle with booze. Author Sophie White on her first horror novel and Android R Apple. We're going to be discussing the two in our text block. There's going to be loads more to come. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you tomorrow for more Ireland AM at 7.